So welcome back. For those of you who are here virtually or in person, this is our second lecture in E340-542. I appreciate your patience. I, I promise that as the semester goes on, uh, the delays getting the AV working will be fewer. I will not promise they will disappear entirely. Uh, that's life. Uh, I, as always, I need to remind you that this meeting is live streamed and recorded. And those recordings are available to you and anybody who wants to look at them uh, for review uh, and comment. So today, we are going to be talking about uh, networks. And I'm going to start out by doing a little bit of biology. And this year, I've added a couple of thought exercises, just the way last time we did a little bit of thinking uh, we're going to have a few thought exercises about networks. I sent out uh, a preliminary version of the a project assignment, which I'll go over with you. I'm going to push it back by a week. I think it was it. It's too soon to try to get that done. So everybody, don't panic. You're going to, I'm going to give people an extra week on that. I want to talk about that with you when we have a chance. And then we're going to talk about the main kinds of networks that you're going to run into in these classes. Some people will be familiar with that. Some people may not. And then, uh, depending on how much time we have, we will start playing with antimony code. So this lecture will really be in two parts. The first part will be really about biology. And the second part will be about modeling. And maybe it's worth saying that I just got back. If I seem a little tired, I got up at five o'clock this morning to get back here to teach this lecture. Uh, I was at a, something called WC12, which is a conference uh, on toxicology. And there is a lot of interest these days in not having to test chemicals on animals, uh, what are called um, new assessment methods, NAMs, uh, which mainly are in vitro methods for doing uh, chemical toxicity assays. And the problem with those is that cells in a dish don't behave like the cells in your body. And so there's a lot of interest in using computation to try to extrapolate from what you can measure in vitro to what you can do uh, in a person. And so a lot of that meeting was about trying to develop computational methods uh, for assessing uh, chemical toxicity. It may not seem like perhaps the most glamorous thing to do, but it's, uh, it's a big industry. Um, shampoo, cosmetics, uh, agricultural chemicals, industrial chemicals, uh, there are tens of thousands of them that are used commonly. I think the, the, main, the standard list in the United States runs to 50,000 chemicals. Most of those have never been assessed for toxicity. Most of them are probably okay, but still. Um, there are typically 400 or 500 additional uh, chemicals that are registered each year, new ones. Um, and so uh, how you uh, allow the development of biotechnology and industry uh, and keep people safe at the same time is actually pretty problematic. You want to do both. And so if anybody's ever interested in the possible of a possibility of an industrial future, um, things like drug development may be more uh, snazzy as a concept or maybe be more familiar. But the flip side of the biochemical activity of a drug is toxicity. There is no, there's no way you separate those two things. And so uh, the, the job opportunities in the area of, of computational toxicology are really enormous. They can't get enough people. So uh, something that you might might think about. Procter & Gamble is in Cincinnati, and they have 10,000 people probably working in toxicology in Cincinnati. Uh, it's, uh, it's impressive. So just to, to let you know uh, some of the context for this. All right, so we're going to talk about that a little bit, and then we're going to talk about do some exercises with antimony. 
So again, I would recommend uh, looking at the basics. I often say you need a Wikipedia level knowledge. So you'll see me cite Wikipedia sometimes. Uh, we're still in the chapter one of Herbert Sauer's textbook. I hope people have been able to get access to the textbook one way or the other. If you haven't, let me know. Start on chapter two. I'd like people, I understand it's a little bit difficult if you haven't done this kind of thing before to think about a project when you haven't really worked with networks. Uh, but I would like people to start thinking about what might be fun for you as a project um, so we can talk about them together. And again, these can be, I would encourage you to do these projects in teams, at least pairs. Uh, and so uh, if you don't have an idea of what you want to do, but somebody else does and it sounds interesting, that's fine. And I would like people pretty soon, next couple of weeks, to present their project ideas so that people can team up and come up with things that work. Um, I created a Google Doc uh, where you can put a little description of yourself and a teaming ideas uh, up online. I think uh, Hayden will share that in the chat with you. I also emailed it to people. If there's an access problem, please let me know. So we started out uh, last time we talked a little bit about network applications. Uh, we talked about networks in a variety of situations. Today, we're gonna to come back and, and sweep in some of those biological examples to talk a little bit more detail about uh, those kinds of networks. And then uh, we're going to go back into the competition. Uh, the fundamental concept of a network is in a sense very simple. You have nodes, there is some information, some state that lives on each node. Those nodes are connected by links that define their relationships. And typically in the networks that we're going to be dealing with, those relationships are either chemical transformation, transport, or regulation. And so we're going to usually either see an arrow, which represents either mass, either transport or chemical transformation with a pointed, a barbed arrow. Uh, we'll see a lollipop arrow, which means activation. That'll point to... Uh, and we'll talk about how those are used. And a blunt-headed, a T-arrow, will, will represent inhibition. And again, we'll define that in a little bit. And Elmer. Yeah, but I'm used to hear edge and not links. Why is this one the preferred or is it totally the same? Elmer says, why are we calling them links rather than edges? And the answer is that uh, different fields have different terminology. Um, if you're a chemist, you would call these chemical reactions. Uh, if, you were a bio if you were a biologist, you would typically call them uh, regulatory arrows or regulation. So uh, it definitely, if you're somebody coming from library science, you would definitely call them uh, uh, edges. Yes. But that's not a term that you'll find in 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 any of the literature that we deal with. Really? Well, okay. no, I should be careful. Yeah. It's not the standard term. Thanks. You'll find you'll find that there are many different terms and many different notations, and so we have to deal with the fact that there, as as I, as Jim Sluka likes to say, right? The great thing about standards is there's so many incompatible ones to choose from. <laughs> so. Uh, so I shouldn't say I shouldn't have said that. It really uh, the the terminology is not perhaps so important. Uh, I will call them links, um, but if you want to call them edges, I won't. I won't complain. If somebody else has a term they like better, it's okay too. Arrows. How about arrows? They're arrows. Okay. Arrows are going to represent interactions, um, and subject to dynamics, uh, they lead to change of state on the nodes. And then we talked about what a model is, and we had this sort of abstract concept of a model structure, model parameters, and output metrics. And this, this concept is very clear in a network because the model structure is the topology of edges, edges, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, nodes, or links and nodes. And uh, the state is the input parameters, it's also the rate constants. And we talked a little bit about the fact that you can imagine two things happening. You could reorganize the network, change its structure. You could change without changing the, the state on the individual nodes. 
or you could change the uh, state on the nodes without changing the pattern of links or edges. You could, of course, do both. Uh, we're going to be focusing on situations in which the network topology is defined, uh, and we're going to be asking a question of what that network can do rather than how you transform the structure of the network. Okay. And we're typically going to be thinking about rate laws. That is that the links define rules that tell us how the values on one node affect the values that that link connects to. And there are going to be multiple ways of writing rate laws. Uh, we're going to be focusing on first order continuous ordinary differential equations, but there are Boolean and stochastic ones as well. We will do some stochastic rate laws later in the course. The specific functional form, the mathematical form of the rate law on the link is going to depend on what you're trying to represent. And then we introduce the idea of a chemical reaction. Here we have A plus molecule A plus molecule B reacting to form molecule C. And one of the standard assumptions in chemistry is that the rate of forward reaction only depends on the concentration of the reactants, not on the product. So then we can write generally a form velocity of reaction, forward reaction of A, B, and the notation that the italicized version of the chemical name is the concentration of that chemical. And so A plus B goes to C at a rate VF of A comma B uh, creates three differential equations, one for the destruction of A, one for the destruction of B, and one for the creation of C. If we don't know anything else and it's a chemical reaction, we know that there can't be a reaction if we don't have any of the chemical. And the simplest form we can write is what's called the law of mass action. And either later today or possibly next week, we'll talk a little bit about where the mass law of mass action comes from. It's not just pulled out of the, out of the air. It's basically a result of the idea that in order for a reaction to happen, you have to have two molecules near each other. And the law of mass action basically is the probability that two molecules are close to each other given the concentration. Okay. And we also started to introduce antimony syntax. And as I mentioned before, antimony is not the most powerful language in the world. It's not the most expressive language in the world. Uh, but it has the great advantage that it's extremely simple. And in particular, if we have a chemical reaction like A plus B goes to C, at a rate vf of a comma b we almost type exactly that uh, we name the reaction r1 colon a plus b arrow c semicolon semicolon maybe could be a little bit confusing k times a times b for mass action that's about it and then in uh, python we have uh, a function that loads the it's a Python Tellurium library. We have a function that loads that model called te.loada. Uh, that parses the model, and we'll come back to why that is significant uh, in a little bit. And then we can simulate that model, our uh, result equals r.simulate, and we say that starting time, the ending time, and what the granularity of the computation is. We make the Granularity of the computation too fine slows things down. If we make it too coarse, we'll get numerical errors. Uh, something that we didn't talk about, which is sort of a nice feature of uh, Tellurium, uh, some other languages that are similar to it, is that if I invoke r.simulate multiple times, it will continue. So if I say r.simulate 0, 10, 100, and then a line later, I say r dot simulate 0, 10, 100. I'll have actually simulated 0 to 20. So the last value that is returned by r dot simulate is used as the input for the next state. So if I want to do uh, run the simulation for a while, do some analysis, make some changes, and then continue it rather than to have to restart it, uh, that, that's the default 
And that means that if I want to start the simulation again, I actually have to invoke a reset to, re to, to clear the things that I've done. Again, this is typical of declarative uh, model specifications. And it, it, it is important to remember that these antimony specifications are not programs. Uh, they're not executed sequentially, and, and so they are, behave a little bit differently from a, a procedural one. Okay, now I'm going to go back to a little bit of biology. And uh, if this is unfamiliar, that's fine. Um, you can feel free to ask questions and clarification. Um, you don't have to understand all the details. It's really to give you a flavor for some of the ideas and the language. Again, you can Wikipedia most of these ideas. Uh, that level of understanding is good. Herbert, Herbert has uh, an introduction in his textbook. Uh, some of the other textbooks like uh, Alon or Paulson go into more detail on some of these concepts if you want it. Uh, we're going to stay pretty broad brush here. One of the things that you're going to be doing in this class will be replicating a network model or building a new network model as a project. And so one of the things that I want to direct you to are databases of network models. And the first two are classic bioinformatics databases, uh, which will have lots of network diagrams uh, based on molecular uh, biology, uh, but won't be executable models. They will have model structure, and very often that model structure could be read into a language like antimony, uh, but uh, there won't have any rate laws or rate constants. And so if you actually want to make one of those runnable, you have to do rather a lot of work. On the other hand, that's where people deposit their experimental results. These days, probably they're newer things. If somebody has a better database than KEG, uh, I'd be happy to put it in. Um, down at the bottom is the one that I would send you to the most often. Uh, Biomodels uh, is a database specifically of executable models. And so they're not going to be nearly as many, and they're not organized in a, as uh, orderly a way as something like KEG is. Uh, but those are actually models written in the SBML language, uh, which is an exchange language. Um, and uh, there's a one-line command. If you look in your cheat sheet that I sent out last week, there's a one-line command that will allow you to read in an SBML model and turn it into antimony and run it. Uh, so any model that's in that database, you can pull down, <laughs> you can download and we'll talk a little bit about how to do that in a bit and run with, with minimal effort. Now, not every antimony model is in that database or uh, for SBML models in that database, uh, but it's, uh, it's a nice resource. And, and the people who run that project in England, it's in, it's in Cambridge, uh, UK, uh, are, are friends. And so if something strange happens using it, uh, uh, we can ask uh, Sharif to help us out. Uh, one advantage here is that we have uh, Herbert, who, who's the, you know, the master of uh, antimony and tellurium, and, and now also biomodels, we have uh, uh, access to the people in charge. So if there are problems, we have some resources. Okay. We talked before about the three main kinds of biological networks. I'm going to sweep back. Uh, through these again, uh, they're shown here. This is a figure from the textbook, which I, there's a better version of this figure, which we'll sweep back to a little bit later, um, where we have a concept of uh, metabolic networks, which basically handle the cell's energy budget and the synthesis of uh, structural molecules in the cell, functional molecules in the cell. Uh, and those typically operate on rather short time scales, uh, microseconds to seconds. Then we have signaling networks that primarily communicate information from outside the cell to inside the cell, sometimes within the cell, which operate on time scales of seconds to minutes. And then we have a slower time scale where we turn gene expression on and off. Uh, that could lead to uh, long-lasting changes in cell behavior. 
uh, things like cell differentiation. And those gene regulatory networks typically operate on scales of, they can't operate on scales of much less than 15 minutes. And we'll come back to why that is in a little bit, uh, but they can operate on much slower time scales. Uh, that highest level gene regulatory networks essentially changes the identity of a cell. And so the questions we're going to ask are basically, how does the identity of the active networks in the cell change when we do something to the cell? Uh, in the middle level, it's how does the state of the cell change uh, under some kind of external signal or internal signal? And then the metabolic network really is how does the production of cell components and energy change? Uh, now, these things are all coupled together, and they're coupled perhaps more intimately than is shown here. For example, if you want to think about how cells die, uh, cell death is, is highly controlled in most cases in organisms. And uh, there's a very intimate linkage between uh, metabolism and cell death. It's still not fully understood scientifically. Uh, the key issue we have to think about with the time scales is that if we wanted to run multiple networks next to each other, um, typically we're going to have to simulate at the time scale of the fastest network. And so if we have to include metabolic networks at millisecond or microsecond time scales, uh, then we can't typically simulate very long times. If if people are taking Vikram's course and you're doing molecular dynamics, you know, well, they're fantastically beautiful models, but you can simulate picoseconds or nanoseconds of time. You can't simulate minutes, let alone hours or days. And that is an interesting mathematical and numerical problem. How do you deal with mixed time skips? That's something we won't really address in this course, but it's a current topic of, of research. And there's some interesting... Uh, textbooks on that topic if people are interested. So we'll start out by talking about metabolic networks. Um, this is a picture of uh, part of the Krebs cycle. Um, uh, William, question. Yeah, sorry. Just on the last slide, um, what's it's it said that the uh, like the protein network was for uh, the protein signaling networks was for changing the state and the uh, gene regulatory network was for changing the identity of, is it changing the identity of the net? Oh, it's changing the identity of all the networks. I was just trying to figure out how those are different, changing the state and changing identity. Right, well, this is coming back to that sort of, it's it's not perfect because you can argue that at some level, every possible node should be there and they're just turned off. In which case, all all changes of network architecture are changes of state. But but fundamentally, cells cells often will have modules uh, related to particular functions or particular uh, particular functions that are not turned on. Okay. So example, stem cells stem cells typically have the they have the ability to reproduce an unlimited number of times. They're a source of cells that are used to repair tissues when there's damage. But stem cells typically don't do things like secrete mucus or send neural signals. In other words, uh, there's a trade-off between specialized function in the cell uh, and its proliferative capacity. And there are some interesting sort of real origin of life questions about why, why you have this separation. Part of it is, is a practical one, that the machinery that cells use to divide, to replicate, gets co-opted to do other things. So if you're going to be secreting mucus or you're going to be secreting um, uh, neural signaling molecules, then the, the synthesis apparatus that you would use to build, an up, to build the components to replicate the cell is being used instead to synthesize those other things. The mechanical uh, cytoskeletal components of the cell, which we won't talk about essentially at all in this class, although people, there are network models of those, uh, of aspects of them. People have done that sometimes as projects. Um, the cytoskeletal components of the cell related to cell motility, how cells move or how cells exert forces. Um, if the cell's going to divide, 
those components have to be reorganized to organize the chromosomes and pull the chromosomes apart. Okay. And so uh, it's not true. It used to be thought that cells couldn't migrate when they were dividing. It's not completely true, but they can't migrate very well. And actually, you'll see that when cells are dividing, they, they lose adhesion with their neighbors. They lose a lot of their structure, not all of it, but a lot of it, because they have to repurpose um, their components to do something else. And so uh, evolutionarily, it seems that there tends to be a, a divide or do something type specialization that occurs. And it's not all or nothing, but but it, it it's pretty common that that specialized cells like the lining of your gut or your neurons typically don't divide. Uh, and there's a, a population of less specialized cells that divide and then differentiate into them. Does that does that help with that? So the networks, for example, the 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 network that would say synthesize all these molecules related to mucus production in the gut would be turned off in most cells, unless they're differentiated uh, goblet cells in the gut, or in the lung, the same thing, the, 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 the cells in the lining of the lung that produce the fluid and mucus in the lung, also called goblet cells, um, are, are specialized to do that synthesis and secretion. Uh, all of that circuitry is turned off normally. And so there's a special function that turns that on. And other things like cell replication then would be turned off in those cells. Great question. Okay. So metabolic networks are the things we're going to talk about probably the least in this course, uh, although they're the ones that actually come closest to the idea of chemical reactions. And there are available, uh, the amount of effort uh, put into mapping uh, the metabolism inside mitochondria and human cells is enormous. Probably millions of man years of effort. Um, and so these, these biochemical pathways are known very, very well. And there are uh, available online uh, very, very large uh, computable models of, uh, of uh, this kind of reaction how essentially the main the main nutrient in our bodies is glucose that's the the currency that's used outside of cells uh, glucose is taken in by cells it's broken down through the krebs cycle uh, to produce atp and nadp which are the two main energy molecules inside cells uh, and also all of the other components that uh, that are used by the cell the lipids uh, uh, everything else. Now, now some some cells, for example, bacteria will use other uh, sugars besides glucose. Uh, our bodies can use some as well. And there are other things that are needed, uh, but fundamentally, that's the that's metabolism. <laughs> now, uh, fun, uh, ultimately, metabolism is a very complex process. It's hidden away just the way the engine hides a lot of things in the car. Uh, it happens in mitochondria mostly. Uh, mitochondria are isolated from the main part of the cell. And so there's sort of an engine in the cell that's separated uh, from the rest of cell functions. And there, there's some interesting, again, evolutionary reasons why that separation is there. But uh, there, is this question of flow of mass and 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 energy in cells, uh, which is the primary function of metabolism? These are again very large models. They tend to be calculated using what are called flux balance methods, which which evaluate uh, steady state equilibrium results rather than dynamic results, um, mainly because the rate constants aren't known that well. Uh, these days, some of the rate constants are known, and so there are some kinetic models. This kind of thing. Uh, but typically, in these kinds of situations, people will ask uh, if the temperature, or the if you're in certain species, the illumination or the pressure uh, change. How does the production of individual components in the system change? 
uh, something that's very important is if uh, you have different availability of oxygen, how does this change? Because we know that cells switch from aerobic respiration uh, to glycolysis. Uh, these are different ways that uh, glucose is processed in the cell. Uh, uh, all cells do both uh, because both are needed uh, in the life cycle of the cell. But the balance of how much oxygen is used and how it's used change. Um, and in particular, famously in cancer cells, even when oxygen levels are high, they'll uh, behave as if oxygen levels were lower. And that has consequences for cancer progression and, and uh, metastasis. It's pretty common. Uh, William, go ahead. Um, so you were saying that the some of the rate constants were like are not known. Um, how do you figure out what a rate what the rate constant is like it, of a specific you know what i mean right so one of the problems with measuring rate constants equilibria are relatively easy to measure you put in a certain amount of chemical you wait you see how much of the thing you have at the end and that equilibrium constant essentially tells you the ratio of the forward and the backward rates of chemical reactions we haven't done that yet but we'll come to that maybe today if i talk too much then we won't get to it till next week which is fine uh we have plenty of time but uh but just the way if i ask what the the net population what's the change of population in the united states uh, the population in the united states changes it's it's increased by births and immigration is decreased by deaths and emigration. If I just know that the net change in population is plus a million people a year, I don't have any way of knowing how, what fraction of that was. Maybe nobody died at all and there were a million births. Or maybe nobody was born and nobody died, but I had a million immigrants. Um, and so you have the same problem that the, the equilibrium changes are things that tell you what the net rates are, but they don't give you the forward and backward rates separately. And so getting those forward and backward rates separately is typically not so easy. Sometimes they're done, for example, by putting in uh, radioactive compounds and tracking the radioactivity as it moves through the cell. Um, and so there's a, there's a whole technology for trying to trying to establish the forward and backward rate constants. It's a problem with all of the things that we're going to be dealing with, not just this, uh, but in metabolism, because there are so many reactions, it's particularly a problem. Okay. And then there, there often is, is a, a study of pathway structure. Very, it's not uncommon for an individual to have a mutation, for example, that means that they are one of these uh, enzymes that's involved in in processing particular molecular species is defective in some way or functions differently in some way uh, and that can lead to diseases or potentially evolutionary opportunities uh, bacteria in particular uh, are pretty good if you put them in an environment with glucose they'll metabolize glucose and they'll make all the enzymes to metabolize glucose you put them in an environment with a different sugar They'll turn off the enzymes that, me that metabolize glucose and turn on enzymes that metabolize these other sugars. So they're actually able to rewire that metabolic network um, pretty effectively. Uh, in our livers, uh, there are uh, molecules called uh, cytochrome oxidases, SIPs, um, which are responsible for breaking down the... Uh, both naturally occurring molecules in the blood and also uh, uh, exogenous molecules, drugs that we take, toxins that are de developed. And our livers will radically change which, which ones of those are expressed in particular cells and how much of them there are in each cell uh, in response to what's in the blood. So if there's a lot of something that needs to be gotten rid of, they typically put to develop more, put forward more of the molecule that is typically used to break that down. So the systems are quite responsive to the environment they find themselves in. 
Uh, that's typically not part of the metabolic model. That's sort of meta metabolic model, um, but it's a, it's a topic of of uh, significant interest if you're developing drugs uh, or you want to understand the liver toxicity. And one of the main reasons that drugs fail when you develop new drugs is because they cause damage to the liver. So. Something that I have on this slide, which seems a little ironic given the picture, is that you remember that models should be simple as possible when you're asked to answer the question you're asking. And so it's very tempting to say, oh, there is a complete model of a metabolism in the human body. And let's just include that in every simulation we do. Let's put all 30,000 components of that in. But most of the time, you don't care. Again, coming back to my car, my infinitely overused car metaphor, uh, when you're driving a car, as long as the engine's working, you don't care in detail how the spark plugs are operating. And so you can think of metabolism as the engine, uh, and maybe the cytoskeleton as the drivetrain of the car. So the, the, the analogy isn't perfect. But definitely, there are people who are, spend their whole lives worrying about modeling metabolisms. And there's a lot that's still not understood. But that brings us to this very simple thing, which is the chemical reaction, which is the fundamental concept in atomony. Uh, and we have this idea of a right chemical reaction formula. Something on the left combines, reacts, and makes something on the right. And often uh, the thing on the right can combine and go back to the thing on the left. And you'll get these double-headed arrows, and I'll try to use that specific double arrow notation that you see on the upper right here. And I will always try to write uh, a rate on each arrow. And uh, so um, now chemical reactions can be relatively complex in structure. Uh, for example, we could have two molecules of ADP, adenosine diphosphate, uh, react to form one molecule of adenosine triphosphate and adenosine monophosphate. That's called the phosphorylation reaction. It's one of the most important uh, reactions that happens in cells. And we'll see that not once, not twice, but hundreds of times uh, in the course of a class like this. Maybe, well, we won't do that many examples, but, but almost every example you do in biology will have a phosphorylation reaction. That's one of the, the, the key things that happens in biology, which is the moving of a phosphate group from one place to another. Okay. So in this case, what are nodes? Nodes are chemical concentrations. Sometimes it's more convenient uh, to specify the amount of a chemical. Uh, so concentration is the amount per volume, and the kind of the amount is the amount. And uh, typically, concentrations are more easy to work with, but there are situations in which amounts are the thing you use. And so the node state is just the concentration of chemical X. And then our links, or edges for, for, for Albert, uh, represent uh, chemical transformations, reactions, chemical reactions. Now, in principle, we could have three molecules of A and two of B produce five of C and six of D. Those are all possible. And we know if we look at chemical reaction diagrams, they can have what's called the stoichiometry, the number of molecules of each type that go in and out can be complicated. Uh, chemical reactions conserve mass. Um, and... Uh, that's not going to be true. I mean, in reality, of course, mass is conserved. Uh, but the the arrow diagrams we're going to write for gene regulatory networks and signaling networks will not be mass conserving. So that's something that we have to be aware of. Okay. And a typical chemical reaction uh, will look like, say, S1 goes to S2. That's not a very exciting chemical reaction. Uh, I could have A plus S1 goes to S2 instead. Uh, but one thing that we'll also have to learn is uh, what is the concept of catalysis, which is that there could be a chemical in the environment that affects the rate of reaction without being used in the reaction. 
you're, you, you have a catalytic converter in your car, you have a platinum surface that breaks down certain uh, pollutants in the exhaust, uh, but the, 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 cat, the platinum isn't used up uh, in those chemical reactions. It, it provides an environment that speeds them up. And so this is our first example of a regulatory arrow. And we'll notice here, uh, whatever the species A is, uh, is affecting the rate at which S1 turns into S2. And so when I write the rate law, it'll be a function of S1 and A. And you'll notice that A is pointing not to a node, but to a link. It's, point, it's an arrow that points to an arrow. So immediately we know that it's a different kind of arrow. <clears throat> and very unfortunately, some people will use the same pointed hand arrow for regulation as for chemical transformation, which is a real no-no uh, because they're doing different things. But that lollipop arrow means that the more A I have, the faster the reaction is. It's called an activating arrow. There are a lot of different complexities in biochemical reactions. In particular, you have something called complexes, where two molecules will stick to each other, but not actually react with a, with a covalent reaction. So the two, you have association of the two molecules, but they don't actually uh, react. I guess you could think about well, if I have two Lego bricks and I bring them together, I can pull them apart without I, br damaging either brick. Um, if I glued the Lego bricks together, that would be a covalent reaction. Uh, but we have lots of different kinds of, of weaker bonds in biology. We have uh, Van der Waals bonds, we have ion, uh, ionic interactions, hydro hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions. Um, and so it's pretty common to have things uh, stick to each other, but not, not in an irreversible way. Um, it's probably hard to see in this diagram, but you'll see a lot of little curvy arrows coming in and out. Uh, you'll see something. I wasn't really going to go into this in detail, I don't, but if you see something like here, you'll see something comes in. This thing starts here and comes in, touches something, comes out again. Those are all phosphorylation reactions. I'm either adding a phosphate to a molecule or taking it away. And 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 phosphorylation is such an important concept in biology that it sort of privileges. It it is a chemical reaction. It is a covalent reaction, but but it's sort of privileged as something special. Is it from here and in? Well, I think almost all of the, well, that one, let's see, I, I'd have to look. I pointed at one which may not actually be a covalent. Yes, that one I pointed to was actually, the blue ones are actually phosphorylation. Okay. Yeah. Where adenosine triphosphate comes in contact with an enzyme, it transfers one phosphate to the enzyme. So that you wind up with adenosine diphosphate on the output side, which then moves away. And the enzyme is left with an extra phosphate attached to it, phosphorylated. That's a. Again, don't worry about that one too much. If you're, if you're, if uh, we'll, we, we will deal with it later when we need to. But but you do get certain kinds of balance reactions. You get certain architectures that are very typical of this. That they'll come up again and again because they'll be true in signaling networks too. I just wanted to make the point here that there are a variety of graphical notations for these chemical reactions. Um, there's something called system biology graphic notation standard, which is one of many standards, all incompatible for drawing these kinds of networks. Uh, and there are tools, some tools online uh, for uh, drawing pretty pictures like this, if you want to, you can go to their website and load them. Uh, there also are, are, are open source tools like Cell Designer, that'll let you draw pretty pathways. Cell designer will also let you run simulations uh, if you want. I thought about teaching the course with cell designer. Cell designer uh, has a lot of capabilities that are more than antimony, uh, but it's also pretty heavy to learn. It's not a, it's not a friendly package. And so 
I'd rather not. There are enough. There are enough things to worry about at once in this class without without having to learn a heavy a heavy uh, software interface. Okay, so I want to give people a few minutes. I've talked more than I expected, but we lost a little time to my to my seemingly uh, weekly glitch with the Zoom. Um, I'd like to give people uh, a series of short uh, things for you to do. And this is, in a sense, maybe to get you started uh, beginning to think about possible projects. You're going to get this four times. And I say five minutes. Um, it would be three minutes, but I don't want to be too long. Uh, you'll get a little homework problem on this where you can go in more detail. What I'd like people to do is just go online. And I, I would say that maybe the biomodels database is a good place to look, but I'm not, you can certainly just go to Google or Google Google Scholar, or I don't know, you could even go to ChatGPT, although I don't think that's this is the best thing to use ChatGPT for. Um, if you're building simulations, ChatGPT is great. If you want information about things, maybe not so great. Um, and I would ask you to, and I'll ask you this four times, for each of the categories of biological network we're going to look at, I'd like you to just spend a minute or two finding, you, know, you can Google or go into uh, biomodels and look for some chemical reaction network or metabolic network. Uh, and very quickly, uh, pull the, the reference to the paper. But you know, who wrote it? You know, what's the reference to the paper? What's its uh, DOI? Um, in one sentence, say what the function of the model is. What is the circuit that's being represented? What does it do? Um, maybe if you like, you could say, why did it attract your attention? I'll be, I, was, I was betting with Hayden a little bit. Is everybody going to show exactly the same model because it's the first model that shows up in Google when you search the same search term that I've got on the screen. That would be a little embarrassing. But maybe find something that's interesting to you. Uh, and then also maybe just read the abstract, because uh, it's only meant to be a five-minute exercise. And just what is the question that the model is trying to represent or answer? What's the point of it? Because it could be, could be a model of sucrose metabolism, but people must have developed to answer some question. So what is that? And then if you have time, uh, how complicated is the network? Is this something that's you know, five components or 5,000 components? And also, if you have time, this could be kicked to the homework too, if it takes too much time. Uh, how is this model presented to you? Uh, is it just a set of equations? Is it uh, MATLAB code? Is it NumPy code? Is it SBML? Is it Mathematica? Something else. So why don't people just take a, uh, this is a new experiment. I haven't tried this exercise in class before. It was a homework problem before. But I thought since we're talking about these networks, it might be, it seems a little abstract to just talk about them. And so I thought it might be more fun if people had did a little bit of digging, seeing what they what they can find. So why don't people just take five minutes here uh, to do a bit of digging, and at the end of this, I will ask uh, one person, maybe two, to just volunteer the answers to those questions. Not even a screenshot. Just tell us what they found. And if nobody in the class volunteers, then I will call on somebody. Uh, and we're going to have four exercises for the four kinds of networks. And then in homework, I'll ask you to dig in on one of them and write it up a little bit more. And the main, there are two reasons for this exercise. And reason one is that it would, it's useful to think about what kinds of networks these different kinds of networks do. And reason two is that uh, not this week now, because I kicked it back a week, but coming up by a week or two, I'm going to be asking you to propose a couple of possible projects for the class. And those projects will not definitively, but most likely be based on papers like these. And so to get some experience looking up papers like these and just quickly looking through them and asking, is it interesting to me? 
is I think worth worth spending a little time on today. And if people, as I've said before, if people come up with databases that they find that are that are more useful than the ones that I've suggested, uh, we can definitely add them to the slide deck and the resources for the class. So there always are new databases of networks. For most of these like paper or most of these like sites that is like okay paper on metabolic plant whatever path whatever like pathways it mm -hmm. takes you to a website and it has the abstract and the references and the citations but it doesn't have the paper mm -hmm. or like maybe it, you have to get you have to purchase it or you have to get right you have to get access for it i don't know if i'm uh, looking yeah. at the right well so it's certainly possible if you go to say google scholar some of those papers won't be accessible to you yeah um in general in general if the papers were published in the past 10 years and they had federal funding those papers have to be made uh open source open access after a year oh and so copies of those will be deposited in uh they're not always made publicly available by the publisher, but they have to be deposited in um, okay. PubMed or PubMed Central. Okay. Now, older papers may not be available, and newest and new new papers may not be available, and uh, and the links that Google Scholar gives sometimes are strange. They're not always the ones that you want to find the paper most easily. Um, if it's in a journal that that you require require access to then you might have to use your vpn and go through iu libraries if it's really a journal we don't have then you have to go to interlibrary loan and ask for it but one of the reasons i suggested using bio models is because all that material is available publicly uh, but again uh, it's a great question and and certainly the goal here wasn't to try to force you to learn how to do how to how to track down every possible model uh, and so i guess if if you found something, gee, that sounds really neat, but after 30 seconds, I can't find it, I would bookmark that and then find something else just for the purpose of class. And as the homework problem, if you're interested in tracking it down, that would be great. I just know something interesting. So, so for the people who are on Zoom, I changed the screen share. So you are seeing biomodels, but the display here in the room didn't change. So uh, I apologize to the people in the room, but uh, the link uh, to biomodels uh, is on the is on the uh, screen, so you should be able to get that without my having to show. But here I search glucose metabolism, and I pull up a whole bunch of hepatic glucose metabolism in type two diabetes, uh, uh, carbon metabolism of yeast. Um, circadian disruption of hepatic liver glucogenesis. So, so there, there are lots of metabolic models. If I just do sort of general chemical reactions, then I don't, I'd have to think of one to search. If I just type in chemical reaction, it's going to pull up every, every, every data, every uh, model in the database. It's not going to be very interesting. Did anybody find something they'd like to share? Again, this isn't meant to be an exhaustive exercise. It's really just a, a sort of a quick exploration. Everybody's looking down here. <laughs> Nobody's turned their video on except right. William. William, okay, so tell me, do you want to screen share it or just tell us? Oh, well, I mean, I kind of just found it. Uh, That's okay. That's okay. okay. Just tell us what it is. It is the yeast aerobic metabolism. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm obviously, I'm not a biology, I don't really know much about biology, but I found this interesting um, because of yeast, because I like to <laughs> bake bread, um, but um, yeah, it, it's on, yeah, I don't really have much else to say because I don't really understand a lot of it, but. Is it is it an executable model or is it a, a, a the biochemical network? Does it say is it a, is it a computer simulation or is it? Yeah, yeah. it's it's on um, 
bio it's in, models. It's in bio models. Okay. Yeah. So it has model files and then addi additional files like dot like a PDF of what it is describing it because it's actually kind of cool and a a graph of some kind. Oh oh oh! It's it's what we were talking about in class. Uh, wait, maybe I should. I don't know, but it's um. Should I share? I don't know. Sure, I can. I can stop sharing. You can share. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, this was one. Uh, I don't know if you could see this. Oh yeah, that's fine. Great. So this was one of. I don't know. It, this was just a. Uh, their graphs with glucose. Yeah. Great. So this looks complicated. But it's not. Yeah. It's not the prettiest. It's not the prettiest arrow diagram in the world. If it were SVGN, it would be a prettier diagram. But but I mean, that's fine. But that's great. That's I mean, that's really I was just that's the level of, of what I was asking for here. I just want people to give it a shot. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have one they want to share? Or do you want to wait until we do the next exercise? So, uh, OK. So I also found one with it's basically looking at uh, the rate of glycerol production, which is a byproduct of ethanol fermentation in yeast. Yeah, the model is an SVG in view, but they mm -hmm. also have a uh, SV inbound. Right. And there's only three, three uh, different reactions. So the, in this case, it was it was to repeat, because I don't think everybody heard. So this is a model also in yeast uh, of of another metabolic component, specifically, you said it was a metabolism of, of ethanol, of ethanol by yeast. So we typically think of yeast as producing ethanol, but of course they also will metabolize. So, and in this case, there was a diagram, a, a layout diagram in SPGN and also an executable SPML model. Okay, great. So let me let me. I know there are other people who said they wanted to share, but let's let's move on because we get we'll get four chances at this, and I want to get through. I want to get through all my network types uh, today, and then we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back uh, to that uh, again. the The main point here is not to be afraid of these things. I mean, they're not going to be familiar from the beginning, but but. Uh, and then they don't do any harm. They're really they're they're really not going to bite. I see. I'll learn. Yes. If you now look for the model, are you going to buy the models, or are you just searching for papers? What is what is your approach? Elmer says, "Should I? What do I do when I'm looking for models?" He says, "Do I look at Google, or do I look in in uh, somewhere else, bio models, or somewhere else?" The answer is yes. <laughs> Um, Biomodels is nice because all of the models there are executable and they're represented in SBML, which is a language we can run. Uh, many of those models are actually curated, which means that somebody actually went through them, checked that they actually do what they say they do, uh, wrote annotations and everything else. Some of them are just dumped. Um, and so uh, the, SB the models in Biomodels are great. Uh, but there are probably you know, the, the 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 fraction of of computable models of networks that are deposited in biomodels is probably I would say less than ten percent of all available ones. What do you mean computable? Well, if I if I have a if I have a pathway diagram in a, a database like Keg, it will say this reacts with this, this reacts with this, this reacts with this. But there'll be no rate laws or rate constants. It's just a diagram. It's just the network structure, and so that's not a computable model. I can't, I can't simulate that model. To simulate it, I would have to make all sorts of assumptions about rates and reactions. Uh, if it's in biomodels, there are a few, there are a few models in biomodels that are actually just the network architecture. So you have to look out for that. Uh, so it, there are a few, but most of the models and biomodels are, in fact, things that you can run and execute. Uh, but there are plenty of interesting models that aren't in biomodels because it takes some effort to put things in biomodels. And so people will publish and then they say, well, I'm done with it. I don't want to take the time to put it up in biomodels. Uh, 
so so i so um well if you're in a hurry and you're just looking for an example biomodels is a great place to go for an exercise like this but i, I definitely wouldn't stop with biomodels and what another project what if i find a model that is already published right so what can I then do in my project when I already found something that already runs? Just translate it into, into the Telerium? Elmer says that he's worried that if the model that he finds in biomodels is already working and he uses it for his project, uh, he, he hasn't done anything. And, and I would say the following. Uh, people come into this class with very different levels of preparation, different backgrounds. And the point of this class is to learn. And so if you are a highly experienced modeler and you feel that uh, replicating a published model is not challenging enough, then by all means, try to do something more challenging. If you're coming in and you're a wet lab biologist and you've never done any modeling, getting an existing model to run, uh, packaging it, describing it, and putting it up in a public repository like Nano, a NanoHub uh, is plenty challenging. Uh, if you can replicate, if you can run the model and replicate the main figures in the paper, that's already quite a bit because usually they'll publish the base model, but they won't publish all the code they use to generate the figures. Uh, so you'll have to do the parameter scans. You'll have to do the sensitivity analysis. And so uh, even replicating a paper that's already curated in biomodels can actually be quite a bit of work. Now, I, I certainly, if you're interested in Warburg effect and you, you want to develop your own model, Warburg effect and cancer cells, I'm not going to say no. But again, the, the, the goal here is to make things enjoyable for people and, and give you a good learning experience. Uh, I, so I expect people to put some effort into it. In other words, if all you do is Xerox or, uh, or chat GPT the paper uh, and hand it in, that's not so good because you haven't learned anything. But the purpose of this exercise is to show that you learned something, uh, and I trust you to, to tell me what that you've learned. What you've learned. Okay. Does that help? Again, yeah. the goal of this the people seem to think that I'm sadistic in some way. The goal of these classes is to help people learn and to have fun. I know it may not seem like it's fun, but but the goal there's a lot of play. When, once you get these models working, it, you can explore. One of the wonderful things about, I mean, wet lab biology is, is very, very powerful, but it's expensive. It's time consuming. Uh, you need to learn a lot of very difficult lab techniques. You can you can mess things up. On a, on, on a computer code, the worst thing that will happen when you mess it up is it crashes and you have to restart your kernel. Uh, so, so the cost of failure uh, is low here. And so... Uh, Using using simulations as a way of playing and understanding, I think, is important. And again, uh, it takes time. I mean, it's like you know, bicycling is fun, but when you're starting, learning how to ride a bicycle in the first place, you fall over a lot. So there's some of that. If people have a better metaphor than that, please get provided. I'm not trying to. I, I need new metaphors. For my life. Uh, so one one comment. Uh, about ne about uh, metabolic networks, which uh, is something we're pretty well not going to explore in this class, although uh, we will introduce the idea of compartments sometimes, which is that uh, metabolic networks, as I mentioned, are often segregated. Uh, in particular, energy metabolism and a lot of synthesis is done in mitochondria. As people may know from their basic biology, mitochondria are basically uh, uh, single-celled organisms that were hijacked by other organisms. So they have their own DNA, among other things. Um, and you could ask, why, why are energy functions uh, isolated from the cell in, in eukaryotic cells? And, and there's a, a, a practical reason for this which is that the uh, many of the components of, of metabolism uh, generate a lot of free radicals. And those free radicals are quite damaging to DNA, among other things. And so keeping them separated uh, from the cytoplasm protects the cell 
and its its integrity. And actually, uh, mitochondrial permeabilization, where the membrane of the mitochondria it gets holes in it, is one of the classic aspects of, of cell death. That's one of the programmed cell death. Uh, but there also is synthesis and, and processing that goes on, for example, in the Golgi apparatus, uh, which is also uh, separated uh, in vesicles. And so it's a, it's a pretty common uh, biological theme that you have membranes that isolate subregions of space, uh, and in those subregions, certain things happen. For example, the breakdown of, of uh, molecular species in things like peroxisomes. Uh, again, something that's quite toxic. Uh, it needs to be segregated from the main functioning of the cell. My main point about this is we're not going to be modeling this. Um, uh, at the most, you might have one box that says this this is the network that's operating in the cytoplasm, another box that says this is the network operating in the mitochondrion, and maybe two arrows that say this is transport back and forth. Uh, but we're not going to be talking about all the spatial complexity. And, and, and you'll hear me say repeatedly that it's a bit amazing that these models work at all because we're neglecting so much of the so much of what's going on biologically. Uh, but often they do. The next kind of network that we're going to talk about are signaling networks. And these actually are, the, I guess, for me, the ones that are sort of the bread and butter of the world that I live in uh, when I'm doing research. Uh, and signaling networks typically are ways that the information that is outside cells uh, is transmitted into the cell and acts on what the cell does. Uh, and there are many, many different kinds of signaling network, but a classic signaling network is something like delta notch, which is shown here on the top on the left, um, where you have uh, molecules that cross the cell membrane. And so there is a molecule that actually goes across the, the lipid bilayer uh, it has uh, something on the outside that has a specialized structure that binds selectively to something in the environment. That something in the environment might be a molecule on another cell. For example, if I'm a cell adhesion molecule or delta notch, uh, it might be a molecule in the extracellular matrix if I'm an integrin. Uh, it might be a, a diffusing molecule like a growth factor in the environment. Uh, if I'm a uh, fibroblast growth factor receptor. Uh, those molecules will have uh, a domain, an intracellular domain, a cytoplasmic domain, that does something when the extracellular domain binds. And very often what it will do is it will release an enzyme that's attached to it. Uh, and that enzyme is typically something called a kinase, which will then go on phosphorylate. And so uh, the the signaling is involved typically involves lots of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. And so essentially, the question is, if you have a, a a wall like the cell membrane, something some chemicals can get across the cell membrane. Glucose can get across the cell membrane by itself. Uh, water gets across. Oxygen gets across. Insulin, I uh, sorry, insulin gets across. Uh, to some extent, um, estrogen gets across on its own, uh, but a lot of the the membrane is relatively impermeable to a lot of species, and so we need to have some way of mediating between what's happening inside the cell and the outside. Once the signal is received on the cell surface of the cell, then the cell has to do something with that information, and there typically are cascades of processing that. Uh, determine how the cell reacts. Very often they're integrating multiple signals together or affecting, depending on the strength of the reaction, the time scale of the reaction and so on. And so you'll have these uh, cascades of reactions. Um, if you're a biologist, they're often drawn the way they're drawn on the left, which is actually trying to represent a little bit of what the, the structure of the chemicals is, the actual molecular structures is. Um, and here we see some vesicles and other things that are going on that are not just molecules. 
Uh, on the right is that uh, SPGN notation for something similar, uh, which is a little bit more abstract. So uh, protein signaling networks typically change the states of cells um, and don't change the network architecture per se. Um, and the inputs for these networks are typically the concentrations of some signaling molecule and, and also receptors. Uh, the output could be the amount of or concentration of a particular molecule, but sometimes those outputs are something more uh, elaborate. Right? If, and again, if I think about our car analogy, if I put my foot and push on the accelerator, the effect is for the car to accelerate. But my foot pushing on the accelerator is not actually applying a force to accelerate the car. And so uh, often the outputs of a signaling network will be something that we like the cell cycle. The cell goes from being uh, quiescent to being proliferating. The cell will go from being uh, healthy to being necrotic to dying. Uh, the cell will go from being non-motile to being motile. And so there's a bit of a gap between the, mo the molecule and the outcome. And that's a, that's a problem that we're going to face when we understand biology. Because modern molecular biology is very, very good at, at giving us molecular concentrations. It's much less good at measuring the actual the things we care about, which are what the cells are doing. That's a real problem. And often the molecular concentration isn't simply correlated. Because it's not just where, what the, how, how much of molecule X you have, it's where it is, what the architecture of the cell is, what else is going on around it. So there isn't simple one-to-one -one correlation between a molecular concentration and a behavior. Uh, something that we will run into again in, 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 uh, In signaling molecules is, is again, phosphorylation. Uh, we will typically see things called kinases. And the job of a kinase is to transfer a phosphate group from the kinase to some other molecule. And the classic sort of almost a joke pattern of this is the MAP kinase cascade. And here you have at the bottom, the star means that there's a phosphate group attached to it. You have MAP kinase, which is turned into MAP kinase star, that is phosphorylated MAP kinase, and it happens to affect uh, cell cycle, cell proliferation, also cell motility. Um, that phosphorylation is done by a molecule which is with great innovativeness and creativity called MAP kinase kinase. As the job of MAP kinase kinase is to phosphorylate MAP kinase job of MAP kinase is to phosphorylate something else. Um, it, in turn, is phosphorylated by MAP kinase kinase kinase. And you can guess how what goes on above that. So uh, usually you don't just add Ks to the end of the name. They're, they're, they have different names, but you'll see this a lot. Um, and this phosphorylation often switches molecules from what we'd consider an inactive to an active state. That's pretty common. Okay, so uh, these signaling networks to, uh, allow us to ask really important questions about how cells work. Um, if I increase the amount of growth factor, FGF, fibroblast growth factor, or uh, EGF, uh, or vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, in the environment, uh, does the cell proliferate? Does it die? Um, if I change the number of receptors on the surface of the cell, um, does the cell respond more actively or less actively to an external signal? Um, if I have a mutation in the gene that codes for a receptor or one of these downstream kinases, um, does that increase the affinity of the molecule or decrease it? Uh, does it increase or decrease the strength of the response for a given level of signal? Um, we don't tend to think of viruses 
uh, as a signaling molecules. But one of the things that viruses do is they hijack, to some extent, exactly the pathways we're talking about here. Um, the influenza will bind to sialic acid on the surface of a cell. Um, SARS-CoV-2, at least the early, the early uh, Delta variant, for example, uh, would bind uh, to a particular cell uh, receptor that was associated with vascular function. And uh, so the, the virus actually has to evolve to be able to bind effectively. And so when viruses become more um, more infectious, very often what's happening is that there, the spike proteins on the virus have evolved to bind more tightly to particular receptors in our lungs, for example, that normally are doing something rather different. They have a function which is not to let viruses into the, into the cell. The virus is using the fact that there are these molecules that exist to bind and pull things in uh, on the surface of the cell, which do normal functions. Not all viruses work that way, but that's pretty common. And so uh, the, the question about mutation in, in either the, the, the ligand, in that case, the virus or the, or the, 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 the signaling molecule, uh, or the receptor uh, can be pretty important. And, and, and there, there's a lot of polymorphism in human populations of these receptors. And then uh, sometimes you have pieces of the network created or knocked out, uh, which could change the, the cell into a disease state. Uh, that's certainly, again, true of cancer, but also we've worked a lot in the area of, of polycystic kidney disease. And in that case, you have a mutation in particular. It's not actually a mutation; it's incorrect expression of a particular of a particular uh, receptor protein, cadherin eight. It shouldn't be turned on. It is okay. Uh, we're going to see these arrows a lot. You're going to see a lot of repetition uh, today. Um, the uh, nodes here are molecular species, typically, like in their, our metabolic network, but they could also be things that are more complex, like rate of cell proliferation, rate of cell growth, level of cell motility. So our nodes could be things that are our species, but they could be other things. Um, node states are typically either going to be concentrations or levels of activity, some way of quantifying those more abstract states. And our links are going to be reactions, as usual. Um, and here, activation and inhibition. If I have more A, then the rate of S1 going to S2 is faster. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Just what I need. Um, if I have more R, the inhibitor, uh, then I get the more R I have, the slower my reaction from S1 to S2. Now you can also have, uh, you can have chemical reactions as well as regulation uh, going on at the same time. But again, the key concept always is that if I have an, an arrow with a point end, well, point that goes node to node, whatever is on the source of that arrow is used up, is destroyed. Um, whereas if I have uh, an arrow that points to uh, another arrow, it's a regulator, so the source is not used up. And in general, we don't always keep track of mass carefully in these reactions when we write them. Of course, in reality, all, all chemical reactions are mass conserving, but, but the way we write these networks, it's again like driving your car. Um, there is some energy equivalence where the gasoline is used up, but but we're not mapping that usage. A key concept here is uh, the concept of a rate law. Uh, if I have uh, different concentrations of A as an activator, I want to know how the rate of conversion from uh, S1 to S2 uh, depends on A. And actually, I really should have, have uh, the, the y-axis of these need to be relabeled. I meant to do that, and I, I forgot to do that today. It's really the rate of reaction that's being changed here. 
But the key thing about an activator is that the, the more A I have, the faster I convert S1 to S2. If I have no S1, I still don't, I can't produce any S2 a diagram like that. Uh, it's also true that it doesn't have to be zero at zero. In other words, I could have a rate of reaction that's non-zero even if I don't have any A. Something that you're going to have to get used to is a shorthand. And biology is full of shorthands that cause all sorts of ambiguity. And if in doubt, ask. And so you will often see something that looks like the thing on the right, which is A lollipop S2, which is A activates S2 uh, without writing what what make what's making the S2. That's where you lose the uh, that's where you lose the uh, mass conservation. And also in this case, the lollipop arrow is pointing not to the arrow not to an arrow, but to a uh, to a species which it really shouldn't do. Uh, inhibition, again, uh, there's got to be some positive, some rate of reaction when there's none of the inhibitor. Uh, and, and as you increase the amount of the inhibitor, the rate of reaction goes down. And again, you'll see R inhibits S2 directly without, without, uh, without uh, it pointing to the rate, to the reaction. So, so if we want to understand that, um, when we see that A lollipop S2, what we have to understand is that uh, this is really something going to S2, which we haven't written, so nothing going to S2, and then A modulating that. Uh, and uh, if we're writing just chemical reactions, uh, modulatory arrows aren't used, the chemical A isn't used up. And so there's actually no arrow in the chemical reaction. It just appears in the rate log. And so uh, we have to get a little bit of practice trying to translate one kind of diagram into the other. Uh, in particular, if you're going to be writing things in antimony, everything has to be in the form of, well, is normally in the form of chemical reaction. And so if you see R inhibits S2, you would write that as antimony allows the dangling arrow. So it would be arrow goes to S2, and then a rate that depends on R. And we'll come back to that a little bit. And usually that empty set sign is the symbol that means that we're, we're not keeping track of the chemical, either as a source or a sink. It's broken down to something we don't care about, or it's coming from something we don't care about. Of course, in reality, the cell's bookkeeping is keeping track of that, but we're not going to keep track of it in our model. Right. There are some spatial aspects of pre signaling networks as well. In particular, a lot of important things happen at the membrane. And a lot of early signaling happens when molecules that are bound to the membrane come off the membrane and do something in the cytoplasm. Uh, there are also a lot of signaling molecules where the binding to the receptor changes the conformation, the shape of the molecule. And that change of shape does something important. And so it's quite uh, pretty common to have simulations, not always, but pretty common to have simulation where you have a simulation, which is the membrane, what's happening at the membrane, and a separate box, which represents what's happening in the cytoplasm. And sometimes the third box, which is what's happening in cell nucleus. Uh, but we, don't, we won't have gradients, for example, the chemical in space which are really there. In reality, there's a lot else going on because these things will interact particularly with, cy with, the, cytopl uh, with the cytoskeleton, which is uh, the motor, motor, motor machinery of the cell. And that's these long, very active um, polymers that form very complex mesh structures, very dynamic mesh structures. We're not gonna do those here in this class. In fact, it's very hard to do them at all. My former student, Julio, uh, is an expert in modeling those, but it's hard, it's very hard. Uh, so uh, when you're going to, when you're going to go to, to, to say, biomodels to look at uh, signaling pathways, uh, you'll find that 99% of them ignore spatial components entirely. The ones that don't will say, 
these set of the reactions are happening at the surface of the cell. These set may be happening in the cytoplasm. Maybe these set are happening in mitochondria or, or the nucleus, but they're not going to have more spatial mapping than that. Any questions about network protein uh, signaling networks so far? They're going to be the things that we're going to model the most in this class. Most of the examples we're going to do will be signaling networks. Uh, we'll find certain kinds of uh, what are called motifs or basic mechanisms. Uh, we've talked about complexes. Two molecules come together, they touch, they bind weakly, but not irreversibly to each other. Uh, they can detach from each other. Um, the addition of a phosphate by kinase uh, is critical. Uh, there are also molecules called phosphatases that do the opposite. They take the phosphate off of a molecule, as sort of the backwards process. And there also is a process called uh, ubiquitination, uh, which uh, attaches a, a label to proteins to tell the cell specifically to break them down, to get rid of. And so you can have active uh, a stimulation of, of degradation of proteins as well. Now, one of the complexities that we're not going to handle in this class, and that in general is not well understood, is that plenty of enzymes have a phosphorylation site. Phosphor phosphorylated, not phosphorylated. Kinase is typically like that. But there are some proteins that have 20 different phosphorylation sites. And if it was just it matters whether there's one phosphorylated one phosphate versus 10, you're okay. But if the specific pattern of phosphorylation is important, you have two to the 20th different states of that molecule, and there's no way you're going to be able to model it. And so um, there, there are computer languages like BioNetGen that were designed to handle these phosphorylate, these combinatorial catastrophes and phosphorylation. But they always assume that all the phosphate, all the phosphorylation sites are the same, or almost always. And there's no reason to believe that that's the case. Sometimes biological complexity is just hard. And we will tend to hope that it isn't when we do things. Uh, but it's important to know. I'd rather be upfront about some of the things that are complicated that we're going to ignore. Uh, okay. So I'll tell you what. Uh, we haven't taken a break. We run over a little bit. Um, why don't we take uh, take a short break? Your next little exercise is finding a signaling network. And boy, there are a lot of those, really a lot. Could be a signaling network involved in diabetes. It could be a signaling network involved in cell growth. It could be any number of signaling networks. The same basic assignment, um, find a signaling network, uh, something creative, maybe. It's interesting to you. And answer the same questions that we asked uh, for our metabolic network. And you're going to find that there's a much more zoology of signaling networks. I mean, metabolism has sort of a core set of processes that are pretty well conserved, um, whereas signaling, there are lots and lots and lots of different kinds of signaling. Um, so why don't we do that? And we'll also take a uh, a short break. And so why don't we come back at, uh, I say it's 5.54 now. Why don't we come back at 6.03? Uh, people can get a cup of coffee or water, whatever. And then, but but also take that time to look at, uh, come up with a uh, an example or two for me. Okay. And it would be okay. I mean, if somebody wants to do delta notch or map kinase, which are examples that I just gave, that would be fine. Uh, vascular endothelial growth factor is another nice one. Um, circadian clocks are interesting. Uh, they, they have gene regulatory networks mixed in with them, but those are also interesting signaling networks. Uh, Chemotactic signaling networks, bacterial uh, chemokinesis signaling networks, 
regulation of uh, signaling networks related to cell cycle there. There are almost limitless number of interesting signals and responses. Okay, did people find something? I, I put in the chat. Um, no, wait a sec, people are coming. I put in the chat uh, a molecule that I had never heard of until last week. And then two separate projects I'm on both said, gee, this is a critical uh, signaling molecule for this project. I, said, I, I, I had never heard of it. So it just shows uh, it can be a bit of business 30 years of their basic things that I don't know because biology is big. So uh, I know I know developmental biology signaling molecules pretty well. Okay, sorry, let me screen share it. Let me, sorry, I apologize. Let me put this up. I put it in the chat, but again, I have to be careful because the screen share is, is funny in this. Um... Okay. So the molecule, that, well, I'll put it up, up there. Let me, let me drag this. So let me, I have to do different things to share in the room and on the, on the, on the uh, there. So this is a molecule called uh, P2Y. And P2Y is part of a family. There's a family of them. And they, what, what they do is they detect extracellular concentrations of ADP and ATP. As I mentioned, adenosine diphosphate and adenosine triphosphate are the main uh, energy signal uh, well, energy currency, they're the main energy transmitters in cells. And normally they should not be outside of cells. If the cell is functioning normally, it's not putting ATP and ADP into its environment. And so uh, there's some argument about exactly what they do because they have very complicated downstream effectors. Uh, but it seems that one of the things they do is they detect damage, they detect tissue damage. And so almost every cell in your body has uh, P2Ys in it. Uh, and under normal conditions, they would be inactive or have low level activity. But if cells are bursting because they're infected by a virus or bacterium, or because you've been wounded, uh, then you'll get a leakage of cytoplasm with ATP and ADP. And these will kick in, and, and then they have a pro-inflammatory response. They'll also cause mechanical contraction. They activate calcium cycles that actually cause the mechanical contraction of tissue. So they're involved in wound closure as well. So a whole, a whole set of downstream signals. Uh, the, the particular mo model that I picked up was this Purvis uh, 2008. And... Uh, if you go to the annotations, there's a note that actually the, the published model is messed up. It's missing parameters. It doesn't make any sense. It's got mistakes in it. Uh, and the, the uh, editors tried to clean up the model, but they're not sure they cleaned it up correctly because it was impossible to interpret the paper. Uh, so maybe that's not the best. Uh, uh, Elmer said, well, well, if it's a published paper in biomodels, is it, is, you know, is it too easy? Well, pick that one, you may have the opposite problem. Even if it's in biomodels, it may be too hard to figure out what it's actually supposed to do. So uh, so that was uh, just to, to show that I'm, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to do the exercises myself. And I, I agree, I didn't do 100% of the things I asked you to do, but at least, at least I was looking for an example. And I thought it'd be fun because that's one, I hadn't searched that one before because it wasn't something I knew anything about. Okay, anybody else have an example they want to, to share with the room? Like Elmer? Serotonin? serotonin? Yeah, and uh, I um, maybe, actually I was searching just by Googling and I found 
talks about the network, but I put actually down the paper, so I don't like to have the range that you can model it. But uh, the network or the cascade takes things, what I tweet takes very nicely. So, so Elmer was looking at serotonin signaling. And of course, uh, no. I, I tend to avoid the nervous system because it's so complicated, but the nervous system is all about signals. Uh, lots of different kinds of signals, uh, electrical signals, chemical signals, uh, ionic signals, and so on. Um, and a uh, very complicated operation. If you're doing signaling in the nervous system, you also have to worry about uh, ion channels, gating and ion channels, which is a different kind of signaling that we didn't we didn't put in our diagram, but but our, our whole other class of, of signal transduction that occur. Uh, and certainly, they're beautiful uh, neuromodulator and neuro and, and uh, neurotransmitter models. That would be quite appropriate to build to use in this class. I think because my background is more developmental biology, I tend not to present those, but they're 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 wonderful projects, and and uh, they certainly fit. You can write those models in in Atomony, and uh, you could do calcium oscillations in neurons. You could do bursting in neurons. Uh, yeah. Act uh, excitatory and inhibitory neurons, GABA. Uh, and so on. So that would be great. Great suggestion. Anybody else have an example they want to present? Ibrahim, do you have one you want to show us, share with us, or Hadi? I did oxen. It's like for plants. Do you want to screen share or just tell us about it? Um, it'll probably be faster if I just told you about it, if that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Um, Oxen signal for like plant growth is the main hormone that signals it. And then this was just found just to adjust whatever current signal they had to make it uh, more efficient and like actually representative. And it has an SBML for, um, save file. Great. Yeah, I mean, that's another example. I mean, again, I'm I'm sort of, I'm, my, my world is, is uh, vertebrate development. So, so plants are, are interesting to me, but I don't know. Oxen is a great example. Oxen has the additional complication that the transporters for oxen, when it's secreted, are, are direct, very directional. And so uh, there's a lot of spatial component to oxen signaling that's pretty interesting. But that's a great choice. So I think, I mean, my point here was not to not to be exhaustive, but just to say, and and depending again, if people don't have never done any biology at all, they may not have that one thing may be as good as another. But you could do viral behavior, bacterial behavior, uh, yeast behavior, uh, plant behavior. There 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 are an infinite number of interesting signaling questions uh, that one could ask. Um, some of these have very detailed models, some don't, uh, and so. So I think that's great. Thank you, Hadi, for being willing to, to to talk about that. So now we're going to move on uh, to our next network uh, of our four today. And as I said earlier uh, last week, there are more than that kind of network, but there, there are four primary ones that we're going to be focusing on. And this will be familiar to people who've taken a biology course, but it's maybe worth uh, coming back to which is the central dogma in biology. It's funny to use the word dogma in science, but there it is. Um, which is that cells produce uh, components primarily through multi-stage protein synthesis. Um, in particular, you have a DNA, which contains a specification of uh, components that will be in a protein. Uh, that DNA is transcribed into RNA. Uh, that RNA then is translated into protein. Um, and there actually are more than those steps. Uh, in the right-hand side, I have uh, a sort of a typical uh, biological diagram where we see an RNA polymerase uh, copying the uh, gene from the DNA. 
there is the initial RNA processing, which cuts out the uh, introns from the uh, RNA, and also the uh, attachment of the poly A tail uh, that's going to uh, control that, that make sure that that RNA is processed properly. Uh, that RNA then has to be exported from the nucleus. It has to find its way to a ribosome. And then uh, the ribosome reads the uh, messenger RNA uh, and synthesizes a protein based on that. And then after that uh, uh, primary uh, uh, translated protein is produced, uh, it will be uh, folded, it will have sugars attached to it, it will have other things done to it. And so, and then that final finished molecule has to be transported wherever it needs to go. And so there are really are at least seven steps between a gene and the protein. And it's remarkable that very often we will just see an arrow that says gene to protein. Uh, and we will neglect the fact that there are all these intermediate steps. Um, one thing that is important to remember is that uh, transcription and translation take a, a certain minimal amount of time because the molecules that are doing the copying first from DNA to RNA and then from RNA to protein uh, are progressive. They walk down the polymer and uh, the, it takes them a certain amount of time per base to assemble the new polymer. Um, and therefore, uh, there is a minimum amount of time, uh, depending on the size of the gene and the protein, uh, typically between about 5 and 25 or 30 minutes uh, before you get any protein from the turning on of a gene. And so there are these substantial delays, and it means that the gene regulation is something that, that doesn't happen fast. Signaling can happen quite, quite fast. For example, calcium ingression can happen. Again, I said signaling, signaling typically takes tens of seconds to minutes, but there are signals like calcium signals that can take milliseconds and that change the behavior of the cell completely. Classic example of that is when a sperm enters an egg, there's a calcium wave that changes the mechanical properties of the surface of the egg so that no additional sperm can enter. And polyspermy to have two sperm come into the same egg uh, will often lead to embryonic failure. It's embryonic, usually embryonic lethal. Uh, and so you don't want that to happen. Usually uh, in, in sexual fertilization, there are a lot of sperm present. And so you have to stop sperm entry very, very fast once one's gotten in. And so that's the case where signaling is very, very quick. Uh, that's sort of special. Uh, plant, plant cells actually do something similar. Um, our colleagues at Purdue who are working on plant uh, plant infection, uh, plant cells actually have some fast responses when when they sense uh, uh, pathogens in the environment. They can change their uh, uh, cell boundary properties uh, very rapidly in response to those. Um, but here we're talking about slower slower cases. Okay. And so if we think about uh, this process, there are a lot of components, really a lot. And some of them are reasonably mysterious. From an evolutionary perspective, I think the ribosomes are still one of the most confusing things there is. How you get ribosomes is, is really rather mysterious. And, and ribosomes also have uh, uh, parts of them are proteins, parts of them are RNAs, functional RNAs. Uh, and they have a lot of pieces. Although not all ribosomes in all species are, have the same breakdown. They, they all have to do the same things, but sometimes sometimes some species, the, the, the ribosome will have fused components that aren't in other ones. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of very complex machinery. Again, we're going to neglect it unless you're si simulating that specific aspect of the cell behavior. When you're going to be transcribing RNA, a DNA, a DNA is twisted in a helix. When you try to walk along the DNA, you twist it. You know from, well, people probably don't know what a phone cord is because no, you don't have landlines anymore, so you don't have phone cords. But in the days of phone cords, 
phone cords would get twisted and then would would ta- would would get what are called plectinemes, where the the t- the, the cord itself would twist into hierarchical hierarchical twists. If you twist a spiral, it buckles in complex ways. And so there are things like topoisomerases that walk down the DNA and and untangle it essentially. Uh, it's really pretty complicated. And DNA is normally wrapped on histones, which make it relatively inaccessible. So it has to get unwrapped as well. There's a whole series of of complex molecular machinery involved, um, a lot of which modulates the expression of genes. And there also are, are modulation, post-translational, uh, post-transcriptional modifications like small interfering RNAs. Uh, so there, there are all sorts of things that can go on here. Um, there are uh, standards for how to draw these networks, which are enormous oversimplifications of the reality. Basically, these standards were designed to try to make genes look like digital circuits, but the reality of gene regulation is much more complex than this. There really is no good diagrammatic way of expressing the complexity of gene regulation. Uh, what's in what's in these diagrams is not wrong, but it's very incomplete. Um, in particular, you'll see lots of arrows coming into one gene uh, to control it. How those signals integrate and combine is really very poorly understood. And so I, I, I'll be honest with you many times that there, there, there are big parts of biology that are fundamentally not well understood. And when we model them, we have to make hypotheses about how these things work. And often we're guessing. That's uh, uh, something that's a, a bit sobering, how much of basic biology is not understood to me. It also means that to me it's a fascinating problem because it means, I mean, I'm I'm not so young, but but even if you're young, you're not going to run out of problems in biology to work on your lifetime. So there's plenty to do. Okay, but uh, gene networks typically change the structure of networks. They change the structure of signaling in metabolic networks because they turn components on and off. So if you have a gene turned on, you're making something. And that thing will be there. If you turn it off, that stuff will eventually disappear because it's got a finite lifetime. And so here you're actually turning on those other circuits, turning on and off those other circuits. Uh, They can also, up to a point, control long-term behaviors like cell differentiation. Although something that we will do later in the course is to show that gene regulatory networks by themselves cannot lead to stable differentiation. Uh, There's a there are a whole series of genes in development uh, called homeobox genes, a hox, sox, and so on, that are associated with the specification of positions and, and differentiation in tissues. Um, but the, the expression of those genes uh, can initiate differentiation, but it can't maintain stable differentiation. It's not possible. When you have the network, you will be able to have a similar attractors is a stable point, so you cannot differentiate and you may not be able to So, Elmer says, uh, and again, this is one of the disadvantages of a split classroom, but I'll try to be, if, 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 if I fail to repeat what is somebody in the room says for our online uh, group, please, please speak up. Don't let me get away with it. So, Elmer Point says that, well, we have a network, and this network will have uh, stable states. Gene A turns on gene B, gene B turns gene A back on. They're either both on or both off. That's stable. That should be something like a differentiation state. Well, if there were no noise in the world, then that would be true. But in fact, uh, gene expression is stochastic. And you can show that uh, transcription factor uh, either a cross activation across inhibition cannot lead to a stable a pattern of gene expression. It can be stable for an hour, two hours, but it can't lead to long long term stability. It's always going to it's always going to switch back to the wrong state. Um, and so uh, cells have very complex mechanisms which 
uh, one could in principle model, although we typically don't in this class, uh, for locking in patterns of gene expression. So genes that are used a lot, uh, the histones that they're wrapped around uh, tend to be acetylated, which makes those genes more accessible for transcription. Uh, genes that are not used much tend to be uh, have their histones uh, um, methylated, which makes them less accessible. And uh, genes that really need to get turned off will be methylated, or the DNA itself will be methylated. It will be modified. So the, when you, we think of DNA as being DNA, but in fact, it has all sorts of trans, trans, changes made to it normally. There are some that are, are pathological, but normally as well. So methylation and acetyl, methylation of DNA is a way of turning off genes. And that's quite stable. Now, exactly how particular genes and particular histones are methylated or acetylated is really not understood. In other words, how is it that if the gene is turned on a lot, it gets, the histone gets acetylated or the gene, when the gene is turned off, it gets methylated. That, that there are, we know what, we know about enzymes that do methylation or acetylation of histones or DNA, but what we don't understand is how they're targeted. How do they know exactly which genes to turn on and off? That's a big, a big, to me, still a big mystery. Uh, not something we're going to solve in this class, but it's a big open problem. Okay. Elmer has a question. Go ahead. So now, you have children with their networks. Um, manifesting those, can we model them with linearity? I'm sorry, say that again. I didn't catch the first part. So, the are children with their networks and diamond testing, modeling them. Or can we do this with Telerio on the morning that you saw there that we have here to model I, them? I, I apologize, Elmer. I, maybe it's because I was on a plane today. My ears may not be working. I, I still did not catch the first. You said, can we use, can we model something? But I did not hear what it was. Can we model gene regulatory networks? Oh, gene regulatory networks. Can we model gene regulatory networks? Ah, so I have a question. I, I, I think I had a comment on the slide. I don't know whether that slide got, got uh, uh, displayed or not, which is that there is an issue with gene regulatory networks, which is that transcription tends to be Boolean. You either are transcribing a gene or you're not transcribing a gene. There are some exceptions to that. In bacteria, you can have multiple transcription, uh, multiple uh, um, uh, RNA polymerases walking the same gene at the same time. So you can actually have multiple copies of the RNA being made simultaneously, which is one of the ways bacteria can actually replicate faster than the time it takes to replicate the DNA because they're, they, they start replicating the DNA before the current cycle of division is half finished. Uh, so that, that that's, uh, well, that's, of course, DNA polymerase rather than RNA polymerase, but the same kind of issue. Um, we have things like bottle brush chromosomes and fruit flies that, that can break these rules too. So so almost everything, there, there are a few things that really are, are, are laws in biology, but almost every biological law has some exceptions to it. Physics doesn't let it get those out, but biology, there's always something that says something slightly differently. Just the way the, the genetic code in mitochondria is slightly different from the genetic code in in in, in the in the nucleus. Um, so we have to accept we have to accept that they're they're rules, but the rules are typically more advisory than absolute. Uh, and, and whether that whether the exceptions are significant or just interesting is depends on the situation. So so the question was. Uh, can we model uh, gene regulatory networks with, with antimony and tellurium? The answer is absolutely we can. Uh, whether it's the most efficient or appropriate way to do it is going to depend on the particular questions that we ask. So very often, and I think I, think I have this in another slide, very often we will assume that the rate of protein production uh, is a continuous function of the amount of a promoter that's present, that there'll be a rate equation that takes us from the amount of promoter to the amount of protein. In reality, because of all these steps in the production of proteins, uh, the relationship between, for example, the amount of messenger RNA and the amount of protein being produced is not so simple. 
And this is a problem in experimental biology because it's quite easy to measure the amount of messenger RNA in a cell, but it's much more difficult to measure the amount of protein. And what you care about is the amount of protein. And doing single cell proteomics is getting better, but it's a pain. Uh, whereas um, single cell RNA-seq is pretty easy. And so uh, a lot of times we'll use the amount of messenger RNA as a surrogate for the amount of uh, protein. That's not always right. Um, the, the step going from transcription factor to production of messenger RNA tends to be pretty Boolean. Um, but you typically have quite a few copies of messenger RNA, and those are transcribed simultaneously. And so messenger RNA to protein tends to be more graded in response. Um, and because of the time delays, the fact that you turn expression uh, transcription on and off, if you average over longer times, then the fraction of the time you're on or off, the duty cycle, can translate effectively into an effective rate cost. And so you do have to make decisions. You can do, uh, some people like, like doing pure Boolean models. Genes are either on or off. And you just say gene A is on or it's off, and that turns gene B on or off, and so on. And those models work reasonably well in some situations. Uh, there are also what are called stochastic Boolean models, where you say there's some probability that gene A being on turns gene B on. But again, A and B are either on or off. Um, and there are other kinds of stochastic Boolean models you can write as well. And so the answer to, to uh, to uh, Elmer's question is it depends, uh, but uh, you certainly can can approximate any of these things with with antibody tutorial. But it's not really it's not really designed for writing very complex uh, Boolean models. Yeah, taking a could this be a project taking a model that exists in the government model and see what I can do with Ethereum and and and, and discussing that. So Elmer asks, what, what would it be interesting to take a published Boolean network model and see what happens when you put it in a rate equation form? Uh, that's certainly possible, um, and I certainly wouldn't discourage it. I think when, when, you, when you ask those questions, but then you have to ask, what is it you want to learn by doing that? Um, the difference from the modeling types. But when I do it, then I need to understand it. Uh, Elmer says he'd like to learn about the difference in the modeling types. But again, you have to ask the question is what is the output that would be significantly different between the two simulations? It's what is it that you're trying to predict that we'd be able to use to say these are similar or different simulations? Um, maybe that one we should discuss offline today. Um, I mean, I don't want I don't want to cut off the discussion as, and I think it's a fascinating problem. But I just, I just, uh, you know, depending again, depends. I don't know, I don't know people in the classroom so well. So if everybody's reasonably sophisticated about the biology, then that kind of discussion is fantastic. If, if it, I don't want to, I don't, I don't mind having a discussion that loses any individual for some small fraction of the class. But if, if the class is going on and and half the class goes on and you feel lost for half the class. Please speak up. Don't wait to have the class to go through uh, and say, wait a minute, I wasn't following. Okay. No, no, I'm not being critical. Elmer says he's apologizing. I'm not trying to be critical to Elmer. I'm just saying for everybody. Um, I This class has been sort of designed to be a, a sort of a common denominator of what level of expertise and, and, and speed and, and detail the typical people over the years have found acceptable. If people complain about something, I'll add detail or remove detail. But of course, every year is different and your needs are different. And so if you want to go into more detail about something and, and that seems reasonable, I'm happy to do it. If people say that's too confusing, again, if, if there's some details that you don't follow, that's okay. Don't be shy about that. Maybe make a note and look it up after class. Uh, if if a whole class goes by and you're not understanding it, please stop me before the whole class is over. Really, uh, people professors say that, but but I mean it. I really mean it. 
uh, I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to snow you, and I'm not here to show you that I'm smart. I promise. Uh, absolutely. William, please go ahead. Well, so, I mean, uh, like, you don't want me to be stopping you at every single um, point where you explain some sort of biology um, intricate. To me, it's intricate um because i don't really know much you don't want me to stop you at every point but it's more like if i start getting lost like 10 minutes in then i should sort of be like okay all right well there again i don't know how to say reasonableness is a strange criterion in the modern world where reasonableness doesn't seem to work anymore um use your judgment in other words i'll sometimes say for example, talking about metabolic networks, that the basic concept that there is some transformation of energy of, of, of nutrients into energy and components. That's an important concept to have. And the fact that that's done in mitochondria is a useful thing to know. The details that it's called the Krebs cycle is probably not so important. Or the fact that there is uh, one kind of transformation that uses more oxygen and one that uses less uh th that may not be so important part of the reason i'm going over these concepts now well, one is that herbert's textbook doesn't talk about a lot of biology the herbert's textbook really focuses on let's do some computation but the whole point of this is to learn some biology to understand biology and the second one is that we're, we're learning a language and as i've said before you have to when you when you learn a language you have to sort of make a decision you have to know some grammar you have to know some vocabulary you have to know how sentences are built uh you have to have some practice speaking but you can't say anything unless you have some words you can't say anything unless you have some basic sense sense of of syntax and so we, we will circle around concepts and uh just as with a foreign language to learn words vocabulary or to learn how people express themselves you have to hear things many times um some of the detail that i'm presenting here i'm not expecting people necessarily to absorb but you will build familiarity i used to joke about that about russian novels right you have 100 characters or 500 characters in war and peace well you may not remember who the characters are the first time but then you see, gee, this name keeps coming up. Maybe that Pierre is an important character because I keep seeing the name. And so, uh, right, there, there are 30,000, 20, 30,000 genes. And there are many more pro gene products than that. And so to expect that any human being knows all of those genes and what they do, well, first, a lot of them, we don't know what they do at all. But I certainly wouldn't expect anybody to know that. Um, I've been working in this field for 30 some years. And this gene that I brought up, that uh, was that calcium signaling uh, gene that I just mentioned, I had never heard of until Friday. Wise up is very important for the processes that we're supposed to be working on. Uh, and so what, what is important is to, is to begin to develop a toolkit to say, gee, where do I learn? Well, maybe I read a, a basic chapter on how cells synthesize proteins, just wikipedia or a simple textbook or gee i'm interested in, in uh, signaling in the nervous system so i look that up because we're not going to learn all of it at once and so uh the goal of this is to and, and this 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 class was originally going to be much shorter i wasn't going to talk about networks so much but i think i think it's it's useful to get a sense of what the words sound like and how they're struck together and a little bit beginning to think about how these words and, and terms map onto diagrams because those diagrams are they're going to be translated into equations and into code and absolutely if you ask me well write down the the gene regulatory i mean write down the mathematics for the network that's up on the screen now with i don't know 70 or 80 genes in it well, to be honest, I probably could do it, but it would take me it would take me a week, and uh, I would make a lot of mistakes, and I'd have to look a lot up. Uh, so, so when it comes to it, we'll have 
networks with five chemicals or three genes. And uh, this idea of what we come back to, which is going to be motifs, is it just as we talked about phosphorylating a gene, phosphorylating uh, an enzyme or dephosphorylating it was a process that happens again and again. You recognize that pattern. Gee, there's a there's a pattern of how you ask a question. There's a quite pattern of giving a command. It's like learning the grammatical structures. And so they're going to be what are called motifs in biology, in networks, that we'll see repeatedly. We just have to begin to learn some vocabulary and some grammar. Uh, and then we'll cycle back and go through it again. Uh, this is a fly through sort of a, looking from the airplane at the, at the landscape. You won't see all the details. Um, but if it's still unclear after that, then absolutely we, we can meet privately and go over things. I can give you a reading or I can rework the class. I can revisit. I mean, occasionally, and for example, in our summer course, there will have been a situation where the, the, the class will say, gee, the last lecture yesterday, we didn't follow it. And we'll rewrite the lecture and we'll give it again in a different form. Take a, you know, that one, you know, give an extra lecture to cover the same material in a different, a different point of view. So, so, uh, so it's okay to, to, to say that. Um, but don't worry about, gee, what is FGF? What is uh, VEGF? What is serotonin? Um, just, just be aware that if you're doing the nervous system, you'll hear serotonin, the word serotonin a lot. Uh, if you're doing growth, if you're doing development or cancer, you'll hear VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, a lot. And so when you see those names repeatedly, then you look it up in Wikipedia and say, what, what does this thing do? Sometimes we don't even know. So that, that, does that help at all, William? Uh, again, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, again, I, 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 the the meeting I was at was talking also about uh, how to teach, because there is this gap that 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 wet lab biologists often feel allergic to mathematics and computing, although they use a lot of computing these days, uh, and mathematicians and and physicists and computing people sometimes are allergic to the complexity of biology. I mean. Physicists in particular like to have very simple rules and very simple ab absolutes. Biology is fuzzy. There's a lot we don't know. And so we have to get used to accepting uh, uncer scientific uncertainty when we deal with biology. Does that mean we can't predict things? No, sometimes we can make very, very good predictions. Uh, but, uh, but we have to be humble in about the level of understanding that we have. Uh, and uh, the more I work in the in the field of biology, the more I realize how much we don't understand about basic biological phenomena. So coming back to G GRNs, let's let's think about sort of questions we could ask. Um, something that that can be quite interesting is uh, you know, whether a gene is turned on or off in in two cells in the same individual. No, in 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 a in a neuron, it's turned on. In a, in a hepatocyte, a liver cell, it's turned off. Uh, uh, even more interesting might be that the same gene is turned on in two different cells, but you have a, more of the protein produced in one than the other. How does that work? Um, it's pretty common to have genes uh, uh, turned off or to have their regulation messed up, especially in cancer. Um, so a gene that should be regulated, that should be controlled, is turned on all the time. It's going to be called constitutively active. Uh, if that's a growth factor, things tend to be pretty ugly when that happens. Um, or something that needs to be turned on isn't turned on. It's turned off, uh, irreversibly turned off when it's needed. You get degenerative diseases. Um, Differentiation, which, as I say, at some level is still pretty mysterious what differentiation is. Um, but uh, certainly during development, we need to have differentiation. During healing, we need differentiation. Uh, epithelial tissues, lining of things like your gut or your skin, continually have stem cells that divide 
produce partially differentiated cells that divide again, and then that differentiate to make the functional cells that, that uh, do the things in, in your, the linings of your scut, your lungs, your skin. Um, if we're going to be an axolotl, a salamander, and we're going to regrow a limb, we have to have all sorts of programs to de-differentiate cells. Uh, if we're going to if we're going to do uh, cloning of animals, we have to take differentiated cells and turn them back into stem cells. And nowadays, they know sort of have sort of magic compounds that do that. Uh, sort of amazing it works, but it does. Many organisms. Uh, and so uh, changes of differentiation state are very important. The only thing I get, I was warning Albert and the biologists in the room, is that the the the, the signaling molecule, the, the 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 transcription factors that do the turning on and off, aren't by themselves enough to to create differentiation states. There are there are these other things that are less sort of shadowy that are needed. Um, absolutely, uh, when we use uh, a lot of drugs, target gene expression or protein production. Um, and uh, a lot of toxicity does the same thing. And there are also certain kinds of things that 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 have generally bad effects on 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 these components. Uh, infamously, reactive oxygen species, um, which are molecules that damage all sorts of things, but including DNA, um, radiation that causes mutation in DNA. Uh, these can all be things that affect gene regulatory networks in, in usually pathological ways, but sometimes functional ones as well. We certainly could come up with a well, much longer list of, of interesting questions about GRNs. Um, there's a whole set of questions about positional information in embryos. How does a, our bodies are segmented? We have a rib cage. Those segments are numbered, and so that when our arms develop, they develop in the right place, at the right position in the anterior-posterior axis of our body. The legs develop where they need to go. How that anterior-posterior positioning is uh, coded is something that's quite interesting. And that's, that's, uh, all, that's GRNs, that's these Hohmann-Bach genes, these Hox genes are, are typically associated with that. Uh, so those are quite interesting. Those interact with signaling molecules too. Okay, notation. Again, we could we could have. A, I mean, it, the thing that's frustrating is it would be wonderful just to teach a course in biology, but we have. But but our, our real primary remit here is to teach is to teach modeling with enough biology that there's some context for it. And 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 in in a couple of years, there's been somebody in the class who 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 was uh, a good wet lab biologist. And who came to me and said, you know, you didn't teach that component of the biology very well. Let me do a lecture. I'll say, great. I'm happy to sit down for three hours and listen to your lecture. Uh, we had, a, back in the COVID era, we had a, a student, uh, one of Maria's students, uh, who who had, was uh, very interested in immunology. And he said, okay, I'm going to give you a whole lecture on how the immune system response works. We'll talk about cytokines. We'll talk about the various immune cell types. That was great. He put together a beautiful, beautiful lecture. I have a lot of his slides because I use them all the time. So uh, if there's a specialist in the room, uh, I'm pro I, you know, at the end of this class, we're supposed to be uploading models to, 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 to Nano Hub. And, and that's not my thing either. So Giuliano, who was here at the beginning of the class, uh, is our is our local Nano Hub uploader expert. Unfortunately, he just graduated. I mean, not unfortunately, unfortunately for me, he just graduated. Fortunately for him, he just graduated, and he's now a postdoc in a great group. Uh, 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 and I'm very happy for him. Uh, but I'm hoping he'll come back and give his class on how to upload to Nano Hub because otherwise Pedro's going to have to do that. <laughs> So, so we again. I mean, coming back to the philosophy, we all learn from each other. We have different backgrounds, and so I'm, I'm happy to sit down if somebody is an expert and hear learn from them. Okay, gene regulatory networks. All this complexity tends to get drawn as something rather basic, which is a little line that represents DNA, a little Q 
kinked arrow that represents uh, trans a transcription of the DNA and the production of messenger RNA. Uh, uh, a regulator of some kind, transcription factor, uh, with a lollipop if it's an activator and a, and a T and blunt end if it's an inhibitor. Um, and um, we know that there are at least there, there are two main steps. There's the transcription into our messenger into RNA, and then translation of RNA into protein, plus all those intermediate steps. But in fact, very often we neglect the messenger RNA step entirely. We just say uh, it, uh, activator I promotes the production of protein P. And boy, is that leaving out a lot of steps. Again, it's sort of amazing it works at all. But in some cases it does. Actually, a remarkably large number it does. Okay. So uh, the nodes in a gene regulatory network uh, now are of multiple types. Uh, before, our, well, our nodes, in, our nodes in our signaling networks could either be molecular species or they could be behaviors. Right, like uh, proliferation states. Um, here, uh, we at least have two kinds of node, one of which is the gene, and one of which is the molecules that are either produced by the gene or act on the gene. And uh, there are a bunch of conventions, and I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to go into all the detail here. I'll, I'll let people. I'll let people come back to it. Uh, if you want, you can look in the slides. Um, the The notation is a little bit awkward because the gene is, in a sense, a link between the regulator and the protein. And so, that gene line could be thought of as a kind of link or as a node depending on how, how you conceptualize it. Um, uh, GRNs uh, almost always are non-conserving uh, non in terms of mass because the components used to synthesize the messenger RNA and the components used to synthesize the protein are just assumed to exist. Unless we're in a situation where the, the organism is starved and therefore we don't have the components available to us, we're going to assume that they're just there. So, so the messenger RNA is basically comes from nothing, and the protein comes from nothing. And there are all sorts of other things that are needed for these um, for these machines to work. If they don't have uh, ATP, they don't have energy; they won't run. Uh, and there are a bunch of other things that are needed as well. Um, and so, we're leaving out an awful lot when we do GRNs. And and the and the Boolean models leave out even more, and so it makes it even more amazing that they can predict anything at all. Uh, but sometimes they predict things that are useful. Um, uh, a big part of it is that you get these these simultaneous signals. You get multiple activators and inhibitors that are involved in turning genes on and off, and we don't really know how those signals integrate. Um, we talked about methylation of and uh, acetylation of uh, histones in DNA. Uh, as as uh, Elmer pointed out, we have very small copy numbers. So talking about concentrations of DNA doesn't make any sense. If you have one of them in a cell, to talk about the concentration of DNA doesn't make any sense. Uh, but we do anyway. Uh, uh, for the DNA, it's maybe less of an issue, but the transcription factors often exist in very small copy numbers. Um, a lot of stochasticity, lots of levels of regulation besides the two that we're going to consider. Uh, things work differently in bacteria. Uh, organization of regulation is rather different. Different things happen. Transcription happens inside the nucleus. Translation happens outside the nucleus on the on the endoplasmic reticulum, and so uh, we'll neglect that. Transport takes time. Okay, let's come back, and we're going to run out of time, uh, but that's okay. We don't have to do everything in a class. 
I'd rather talk and, 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 and have people take the time to digest. So we'll often see a diagram like the top one, which is molecule one promotes production of protein two. P1 promotes P2. And this is a little bit like trying to unpack a Chinese character. I often will use the analogy of Chinese, written Chinese for uh, biology because the relationship between the diagrams and the concepts is not one-to-one. -one. So uh, in the first place, P1 and P2 aren't used up. So this is definitely a regulatory reaction. And we're gonna say that P1 is either a transcription factor or promoter. Uh, and so what we really are thinking of here is that there's some gene that encodes the production of protein P2 and it has a binding site where if P1 binds to it, then that turns on the transcription of the to gene, or at least increases the rate of transcription of gene. And so if we were thinking about it as a chemical reaction, well, we're not talking about where the stuff that makes the messenger RNA of the protein comes from. So the basic reaction is that nothing goes to the protein. Our, our empty set goes to the protein. And the rate of that is regulated by the amount of P1. And so that's the basic chemical reaction. And so uh, in this case, a, a language like antimony isn't really doing anything because the arrow, is, the arrow that we're drawing is not the arrow we care about because there is no arrow in antimony for regulation. There's only the arrow for chemical reaction. All right. Almer Almer is disturbed by the fact that the 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 arrow notation for chemical reactions doesn't map very well onto gene regulatory networks, and that's a very legitimate concern. Uh, but you can express. But let me just let me walk through this next slide, and then we'll we'll talk about how these things can be expressed. So we start out with this idea that P1, if we have more P1, we get more protein. That's the basic concept. And now we're gonna ask how is that implemented mechanically, biologically? And the answer is that P1 binds to the DNA. When it binds to the DNA, the rate of transcription of that DNA to RNA increases. That produces more messenger RNA. The messenger RNA goes to ribosomes and that more messenger RNA leads to more production of protein. Now, one thing that's important when you're talking about gene regulatory networks, which we didn't talk about in signaling networks, is that no molecule has an infinite lifetime. And um, in, in metabolism and, and signaling, typically cycles are closed. You produce something and you have another arrow that gets rid of it. Uh, when you talk about gene regulatory networks, they never, or almost never, draw the arrows that get rid of the things that are synthesized. And so you have to know that at the very least, the protein is degraded. Otherwise, you wind up with an infinite amount of it because you just keep making it, making it, making it. So whenever you see a, a, a regulatory arrow, I mean, a gene regulatory arrow that produces a protein, there's an arrow that's not written, which is that that protein goes to nothing. And typically, the rate of that is independent of the uh, of anything. It's a, con it's a, a basic concentrate proportional to the amount you have. Although I mentioned ubiquitination, sometimes you actually have active degradation of things, so that can change it. So that little diagram P one goes to P two actually turns to nothing goes to P two with a rate that depends on P one, and then P two goes to nothing. And again, I'm not saying that this is trivial. I am saying that when you've seen it a few times, you'll say, oh, well, uh, yeah, when I see this P1 goes, to, it promotes P2, I, I, I have to look it up the first few times. And then after I've done it a few times, I know how to draw that character. Remember, in learning Japanese, you have a lot of characters to learn. You learn them one at a time. And then after you've learned a few, they get easier. Here, there are certain designs that we will learn. Okay. 
Now it happens that that first step, the promoter step basically is on or off and it flickers. And so the rate of production of uh, being de depending on the concentration is really a time average of the, of the production. Um, the decay rate is continuous in time. Um, if we care about the time scales, then at a minimum, we do have to include that messenger RNA step because that's a significant time delay. Uh, almost never is that done. I'd say 90% of the, almost never is not a good word. It's usually not done. 90% of the time, people ignore the messenger RNA step, even though it has significant delays. Um, but if we then want to include the messenger RNA step, then we have our simple diagram, P1 promotes P2, turns into P1, produces messenger RNA. The messenger RNA breaks down. That's actually a critical control of the production of the molecule. Uh, and then the messenger RNA, it in turn promotes the production of P2, which breaks down. And so our simple little P1 promotes P2 now has turned into uh, four arrows. And again, uh, I wish I could make this simpler than that, but that's, uh, that's as simple as it gets. Uh, the good news is that there aren't that many things in addition to this. In other words, it's not like Chinese where we have to learn 10,000 characters. We have to learn maybe seven or eight different characters. And, and once we've learned those, we know most of the things that we're going to need to deal with. Okay. Uh, there are motifs in, 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 in gene regulation. Uh, the first two maybe don't even count really as motifs. You can have a molecule that turns on or off a gene, gene activation or repression. You can have two molecules that come in. It could both activate, both inhibit, one activate and one inhibit. That's hard because you have to then know how they interact. In general, there's a simple rule, which is that if they're multiple promoters, they tend to either sum or be an or. When you have an inhibitor and an activator together, the inhibitor usually wins. So the inhibitor usually is an and. Um, now, that's not almost never exactly true, but as a null hypothesis, that's usually where you start. Uh, activators or inhibitors and. Uh, it's very common to have gene A turn on gene B. The product of a gene could be a molecule that's used for something totally different, but it could be some transcription factor. And it's also very common for a gene product to either promote the gene production of the same thing or inhibit it, what's called autoregulation. And a little bit counterintuitively, uh, autoinhibition and autoactivation, when you do the circuit, and that's one we will do pretty soon, uh, maybe do the opposite of what you expect. Uh, if you ask which one is stable and which one is unstable, you might get that one back. Um, and then you can have regulation of the regulation. So you can have some molecule that comes in and affects how much these things are done. And as always, our friend phosphorylation, uh, whether the particular molecules in question have a phosphate attached to them or not, sometimes the, the, the transcription factor with a phosphate is an activator and the transcription factor without the phosphate is an inhibitor. Uh, so those kinds of things. Uh, the other thing that we'll find, and we haven't talked about actual numbers at all, uh, is that very often genes are always, even if there are no transcription factors present, they're always transcribed at a, what are called a basal rate. There's some base rate at which you produce the protein, even if you're not turning it off. It's leaky. These systems are a bit leaky. And again, the fact that things are slow. And so we're going to run out of time. So this will be our last little exercise. Why don't people look up some gene regulatory network they're interested in? Uh, there is no shortage of them. And if they're in biomodels, they'll probably be expressed at SPML. So Elmer, then if it's there, somebody thought it was worth putting at SPML. And that'll be our last little thing for today. Oh, go ahead. Don't 
Ah, ooh. Boy, that's putting the cat among the canaries. The question was, well, what if you just have patterns of gene expression in a cell? So you do RNA-seq, and it says this gene's on, this gene's off, this gene's on, this gene's off. This is how much messenger RNA I have. Can I infer the regulatory network from that? The answer is no. Uh, people try. Uh, one theme in biology experiment is what are called differential measurements. You'll make the same measurement under two different conditions and see how things change. And in those cases, you could say, gee, if I add this molecule, this gene turns on. Therefore, I can infer that this molecule has some kind of activator behavior. The problem with a lot of what happens is that to really know how things are working, this comes back a little bit to my example with immigration and births and deaths and total population, that if you do something and you see a gene turn on and off, you don't know if the thing that you're doing is directly affecting the target or if there's some number of steps in between. And there are plenty of molecules that seem to do one thing but if you add some additional molecule, they do the opposite of what they were doing before. Uh, because there are some complicated intermediate state that depends on something that you're not considering. Um, if you were able to model monitor gene state in a living cell, then you could infer these things much more easily. The problem is that measure, measuring RNA, at least, is an endpoint measurement. You have to kill the cell. And so you cannot actually do the experiment of let's change it and watch what happens in the cell. Now, with proteins, you can do that to some extent. You can, you can genetically engineer the cell so that the protein has a fluorescent label. So you can watch the transcription and translation happening. The problem is that you're limited in how many things you can monitor at the same time. And the thing you're doing to make the measurement changes the state. It's not, it's close, but it's not the same because you're genetically engineered. Sometimes you're lucky. For example, if it's a quinone, that's the, 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 the output. Well, quinones are autofluorescent. So you can actually monitor the production of quinone without having to put a fluorescent light on. But this happens in neur neurons too, and there, there's some mathematical theorems that if the network is sufficiently complicated and you can't go in and manipulate all of the nodes independently, you can only ma manipulate the boundary nodes, <clears throat> it may not be possible to infer the network from its behavior because there may be internal states that you can never get to because you don't have the ability to go inside of it and control them. I mean, if you think about just a, a computer and you ask, the, uh, what is the circuit inside the computer? Working with the computer, you can do a lot, but I can't see what the circuit is. There are certain things I can infer. It's got memory. It can, it can read and write to files. It can do things like multiplication and addition. But actually what the physical circuit is in that CPU, something I can infer from its behavior. And so um, now in the case of the circuit, because it's a fixed static circuit, I could go in with an electron microscope and actually see the circuit. Uh, the problem in biology is that I can't, these, these networks are not present as physical objects. They're abstract uh, relationship. And in neuroscience, there's a huge amount of effort made to try to infer sort of sequences of, of connections in connectomics, for example, Olaf Sporns here, very famous uh, uh, brain scientist here at IU, who does connectomics. And there's a lot of effort. You see this pattern of activity. You see this neuron activated, and then this one, and then this one. And then you're going to say, well, I, if I see first this fire, and then this fire, and then this fire, I say this is connected to this, and this is connected to this. Um, sometimes that works, but it's possible to design circuits where basically there's a third neuron that's signaling to both of the downstream ones that I don't know about. And so there, there are situations where you could show mathematically that you cannot actually back out the, the network from the signal. 
Uh, and in the case of neurons, you can you can observe the, the changes of, of activity much more dynamically than you can in these networks. That said, um, there hasn't been an immense amount of effort over decades to map pathways. And what I would say is that if you see, you go to a database like CAG, and it says this regulates this, then it's reasonable to say, as a first hypothesis, I will accept that that network is there. Um, however, if you are being careful, you will always ask the question, uh, what if there was a connection in the network that I didn't know was there? That is structurally, what if there was something I was missing? Would it change the behavior of the network? What if there was a connection that was in the network that isn't actually there? Somebody inferred it incorrectly, but it changed the behavior of the network. Unfortunately, that's called structural stability. That's asking the question, is the network behavior robust to, to misidentification of structure? And unfortunately, the answer usually is no. Um, and that that's unfortunate, and we have to live with that. I mean, if if the if the network were giving the wrong answer under lots of different situations, somebody would catch it. And so you can assume that the networks that you see are ones that are reasonable under most conditions most of the time. Can you assume that there aren't connections that are going to modulate what you see or that there are going to be situations where that network will give you the wrong answer? The answer is no, it can happen. I mean, look, 15 years ago, nobody knew that small interfering RNAs existed. This is one of the main ways that, that proteins or protein synthesis is regulated. And, and, and we didn't know, it wasn't known 20 years ago. Uh, is there some other you know, major regulatory mechanism hiding in biology? Well, maybe not. Maybe we found everything. I, it'd be nice. But, but, but we have to, again, we have to be humble about this. On the other hand, if we take something like the SOX ox toggle during early differentiation, early embryonic development, it's pretty well established. This activates, this inhibits this, this inhibits this. Cells either high this, low that, or high that, low this. And one of those is stem cell like, and one of those is differentiated. That's pretty, pretty well uh, advanced. And so we simply have to, we, there's no simply about it. We have to be honest and ask the question each time, well, how much do we trust the, the experiments and, and the, the derivations done from them? And then we should be asking the question, um, are the are the uh, results that, that we get from the network robust to perturbation? Typically, we won't do those tests in this class because it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, there was a wonderful talk in Paris uh, earlier in the year where somebody was trying to do this network inference. So it's a guy in Norway doing beautiful work, has beautiful software for doing this network inference. And you present all these wonderful uh, experimental data sets and you check that the, whether the network is consistent with the data or not. And he specifically does not demand that the networks are consistent with all of the experimental data. Why is that? I'm looking at the experimentalist. <laughs> well, he said that he didn't think that even though it followed the experimentation that the model still should not no, not, you 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 accept models that don't don't agree with all the experiments. Is the is the point? And so, maybe for the people who are not experimentalists in the room, the answer is some of the experiments are wrong. And so, if you insist that your model agree with all of the experimental data, you are almost certainly ruling out the correct model because you don't know which experiments are wrong. And so you have to be very careful because the, the experimental data may not be right. And so if you force yourself to agree with all of the experimental data, all of it, you almost certainly are, are actually ruling out the correct explanation. 